Okay, so this is section 4.2 about virtual circuits and datagram networks. These are kind of the two main approaches to the network layer. We're going to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting. Um, the takeaway, perhaps from um, the whole, this whole section is IP is what kind, virtual circuit or datagram? No, datagram, good call. Um, so that's kind of where we're building up to and where a lot of effort has been placed is in the datagram networks. Okay, so the difference here between a datagram network and a virtual circuit network is, is really the difference between a connectionless network and a connection full network where, or a connection oriented. So the question is, does the network layer work in a way such that the connections that it makes, which are point to point, do they operate in a, without any idea of connections? Or is there some sort of setup, some virtual circuits, some reservations that have to happen first before exchanges occur? All right? does that make sense? So even at the network level between two hosts, do they just get to send when they want to? Or do you have to kind of set up a call, send some data over this virtual circuit, um, and then tear it down when you're done? That's, that's the question. Um, virtual circuits work in this connection-oriented way where there is this idea of a, a, a call set up and a call tear down. In virtual circuit networks, the circuits are defined, the source destination paths, are defined based on a, a virtual circuit identifier, not the host address. This requires router state. Every router state, um, every router on the source or destination path maintains state for each passing connection. Um, and the cost of this is because you've got resource reservation, you have dedicated resources for a certain virtual circuit. Um, that means you have very predictable service. Does that make sense, right? If, if you know that you've got one meg per second reserved for this virtual circuit, then if you want to send, you can send it one meg per second and, and you've got that bandwidth. Whereas in a datagram network, there's no reservations, there's no setup teardown, um, which is nice on the front side, but that means you might not be able to send it one meg per second when you want to because somebody else is, is crowding you out. Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, so virtual circuits use these VC identifiers. They, you have to take router state to keep up with what, where all the virtual circuits are. Um, but because you have this resource reservation, you get predictable service. And if it's really important to have predictable service, then VCs may be the way to go. Um, these are some of the important components of a virtual circuit. You need the path from source to destination. You also need the virtual circuit numbers for each link along the path. Different links are going to have different virtual circuit numbers. Um, and then you need all of the entries in the forwarding tables that are going to maintain what the outgoing and incoming virtual circuits are, virtual circuit numbers are for a particular kind of path. Here's an example, sort of visually, of what I'm talking about. If you've got this virtual circuit number 12 here, um, and we're trying to send between, like I say, this host A and this host B, the virtual circuit that's defined is over virtual circuit 12, virtual circuit 22, virtual circuit 32, and the hosts are going to have to know the mapping of incoming VC numbers to outgoing VC numbers in order to do the, like this is doing forwarding on a local level so that this whole route can be implemented. So you see here this says if I get something coming in on interface 1 that has a VC number of 12, then it should go out on interface 3 with a VC number of 22. So that's how it's doing the forwarding. It's going to have to put a new VC number in and send it out on the appropriate link. Whereas you see here if I get something coming in from 2 with virtual circuit number 63, so that's coming in here, then I need to send that out on number one with virtual circuit number 18. So that's how the, 
the forwarding happens in a VC network. Questions on this? So this is not how IP works, but it's kind of a glimpse at the other side before we jump deeply in the datagram network. Okay. In order for virtual circuit networks to work, they have to use what's called signaling protocols. You can imagine these are the, the setup teardown kinds of protocols. All right, if you're going to have to do um, setting up circuits and tearing them down, you've got to have a protocol for exchanging some packets to create those VC IDs, those VC numbers, ahead of time. And here's how it looks visually. All right, so we're going to initiate a call across the network. Um, by doing this, we get this incoming call, and we have to set up state in each of the, of the routers. Um, if the other <coughs> host accepts the call, it'll send back a message. Um, and this completes the setup of all of the VC numbers. After, only after those steps happen can we actually send real data. All right, this is virtual circuit networks, and this is not IP. And we have to use these signaling protocols to do the tear up. And you can imagine there would be a, um, the setup, there'd be a tear down as well to, to delete those routes if we're done. Let's see how datagram networks work um, as opposed to this. There are no setup, there's no setup phase in a datagram network. Furthermore, you don't need state information about like VC numbers in the routers. Um, packets are always forwarded using the destination address. So you put in the final destination, no pun intended, um, and that that is what every host is going to look at in the forwarding table and say, okay, well, how do I get to this IP address or this address? Okay, go on this link. Um, because of this, packets forwarded using the, de using the destination host address might actually go over different routes at different points in time. So at one point in time, we may send through here, and at another point in time, we may send down here or up here, as this example shows. Make sense? But because it doesn't matter. The route doesn't matter. It's not like we're looking for a circuit. We're just trying to get it to the final destination. Um, there's no network-level concept of a connection. There's just send this on, do your best, get it to the final destination. This is how IP works. Um, I think there's a little bit of, yeah. There's our animation. So this is simple, right? You send the data, you receive the data. Well, what's the downside to this as opposed to the, the VC model? It's not guaranteed. Right, you've lost guarantees. You've lost um, any kind of resource reservation. None of that's going on. If there's congestion, you might just lose packets because the packet can't, the, the router has a full buffer. Um, additionally, you can see if packets from one source to the same destination, kind of you could think about those who are on the same flow. Since they take different routes, they might get out of order, and, and that's why IP doesn't provide in order delivery guarantees. All right, let's think about how forwarding would happen in IP, basically. Imagine that we had a 32 bit address, right? So we are uniquely identifying hosts using a 32 bit address. Right? If, since we're going to be forwarding based on destination address, we need a way of saying this is the identification number for this for every host. We think of this as a, a, an IP address, and IPv4 uses 32-bit addresses. If you've got 32 bits of address for an address, how many possible hosts can be on this network? you got 32 bits of ones and zeros. How many different hosts can be on that, can be defined with those 32 bits? Lance? No, we can do a lot more than that. How many unique combinations of numbers can we make up with 32 bits? Not 32 to the 32, but 2 to the 32. Because we've got, right, you can imagine if you set 4 bits, right? How many different combinations of 1s and zeros can I make with 4 bits? Four. And I can do all the way to 
they're like 15. So every one of these can be, every one of these has two options, right? So that's two options there, which is two to the fourth. So if I had 32 bits, I have two to the 32nd total number of addresses, uh, destinations possible. Now, do you know what two to the 32nd is? Is it in like four billion? So we've got four billion possible destination addresses. If we create a forwarding table that has de possible destination address and the outgoing interface that it should go on, all right, how big is that table going to be? Huge. It's going to be four billion rows long. And if we could imagine that, I mean, we're going to have to store at least four bytes for the 32 bits, and maybe we just take one byte for the outgoing link, that's five. So five bytes times four billion, how big is that? Five times 20 billion, which is 20 gigabytes. Yeah? So it would take 20 gigabytes of space to store an exhaustive forwarding table. That's a problem. You see that? Because that's something we have to keep in memory all at all times. How can we avoid this? How can we not um, have an exhaustive forwarding table? We need to make this smaller so that routers can actually keep it in memory and can efficiently do forwarding. Any ideas as to how we could consolidate that table and not store every address? Well, let me throw one out. What if we could put ranges and say, okay, addresses 1 to 35, go to link interface 0, and 36801, and so on and so forth. If we did that, then all we'd have to remember is a 35, an 800, and a 1,005. And we know as long as it's that number or less, go to that interface. So we've cut our 4 billion down to basically 3, because we've got an otherwise, right? So if it's anything larger than 1,005, go to 3. This looks like a viable solution, yeah? Much more compact. So if we were to imp draw, make this in binary, what would it look like? Well, if I'm just going to convert 1 to 35 to, in binary, 32 bits, um, Imagine then we've got something like this, where we have these ranges of addresses. Mm -hmm. Now, how can we very quickly determine where a datagram should go given its um, address, its destination address that it's going to? Do you see any patterns in here that might be helpful to us? Okay, I think I have a typo right here. That one should not be there. Do you notice that these, um, these are all in 8-bit chunks? The first 16 bits of both of these numbers are the same. And down here, well, actually it's more than 16, right? They're, they're the same all the way up to this bit right here. That's the first difference between them. If we go down here, we can see something similar, right? Where they're, they're exactly the same all the way to this bit. Yeah? And the same goes for this. If I got rid of this one, they'd line up correctly. All right, we can take it through here and find where the first difference is, which should be right, that zero and that one. What we have discovered here is something that routers have used for a long time to do forwarding, and it's called prefix matching. The idea is we can encapsulate a range of addresses by just remembering the longest prefix that, that the two numbers have in common. So really that prefix, those three pre prefixes you see there are really just ways of defining ranges. 
Okay, you with me? Um, and the way, uh, let me show you how that a router can quickly do this. It's going to check an address, say we're giving that address right there, um, and we're going to determine what prefix does it match the best. Because whichever prefix it matches the best, where the best means the most number of bits, that's basically the range that it's closest to, the range that it's in. Um, so we see there on prefix 0, we have 8, 16, 16 plus 4, 20-bit match. Yeah? What if we compare address, the address to prefix 1? Well, if we do it to address 1, we see that we have that same 20-bit um, match. Sorry. You see it there in red. All right, let's compare it to prefix 3. Oops. Um, and there you see we actually get an extra bit there. So that's 21. That means that that's the that's the range that we are most correctly uh, in, most precisely in. So that's the interface that we need to be forwarded on. Okay? So this is how routers can quickly match a destination address and do forwarding to the correct outgoing link. This is called longest prefix matching. Um, you could look at this example, which I think is slightly different, and see that it's possible to have multiple matches, but the one that is the longest is actually the best, the, the best match, and that's the one we would choose. Okay, as we conclude this section, I thought there was a really interesting, um, some really interesting comparisons made by the authors in comparing datagram networks and virtual circuit networks. And a large part of their difference can be seen in the systems that they support. In datagram networks, datagram networks were made to support computers, whereas VC networks were really originally designed to support telephones. Okay? What do, when we look at those end systems, what kind of difference do we see? We see that computers are very smart, very capable systems, capable of like, executing, handling more logic, Telephones are very dumb in systems. They can only do one thing and they're very simple. So because of that, it's sort of like, where do you want the complexity to be handled? Well, if you have a dumb end system, then you're going to have to push the complexity to the network core. And that's what virtual circuits do, is they're having to, to handle the complexity of, of the data exchange. Whereas with a very smart end system, you can have a very simple core network, which is what IP is. IP is very simple, best effort. You know, it's not giving you anything special, no guaranteed delays or in-order delivery or delivery or anything. Um, but if you want that, where does it happen? It happens at the endpoints in TCP, right? In TCP, the complexity happens on end systems. Um, because of that, there are many types of links possible in an IP network, right? You can run lots of different kinds of services over an IP network, right? If you run TCP, then you get all that reliability stuff. Whereas you could also run UDP if you want and you get really simple, very quick, you know, no congestion control kinds of stuff. In a virtual circuit though, because there's so much complexity in the core, there are very few types of links. Um, but you're going to always have this, pretty much you're going to have this very highly complex ordered connection based system. All right, so this is sort of a, an overview comparing datagram networks and VC networks. Um, as we move into the later sections of this chapter, we're, uh, we'll really dig in deeply to IP, which is a datagram network, and see how it's implemented um, and how it rules the Internet, um, kind of based on this, these principles of smart end systems, simple core.